What's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Paul. Back with some more Napoleon. Yes, back with some more Napoleon. Even though last episode we really didn't see much of Napoleon, we just heard, you know, he was up north doing his thing. And while Wellington was basically kicking butt in, in his absent, you know. And so now we're on moving on to Russia, which I'm assuming Napoleon's going to be in this one. Uh, Napoleon's invasion of Russia. So this will definitely be interesting. Uh, let's see what kind of battles are. Because it says invasion of Russia. So it didn't really say like a particular battle or anything. So let's see how this kind of like, I don't know, this movement flows into russia and how it starts off you know is it going to start off with a bang and then just kind of like take over or is it going to be really hard right off the bat uh i don't know uh this will be fun to watch and fun to see and yeah oh yeah also also wanted to say uh uh when you guys uh mentioned uh a tv show from the 90s called sharp i think it was called uh and it's actually on YouTube, a bunch of episodes. I actually watched, like, you know, a few of the videos of it. It's like, uh, the first thing was, like, maybe the first episode. And uh, it's actually not bad, you know. And it takes place in this time period with the, the Spanish, you know, and Napoleon's French versus, the, you know, the Spanish and, the, you know, the British and stuff. And it's actually pretty interesting. So I, I really do appreciate that uh, request because it, what I've seen so far of it is pretty good, and I'm going to continue to watch that TV show. So, <laughs> thanks a lot on that on that front. Sharp, I think it's called Sharp. I might I might be wrong, but sorry, indigestion. But uh, yeah, anyways, let's get to Napoleon invading Russia, invasion of Russia, 1812. And before I do, please hit that like and subscribe, guys, if you haven't yet, and we will get into the video. Russia, 1812. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army, Europe. One second, I'm gonna turn my thing up here. All right. Our ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Russia's resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. Uh -oh. And as winter closes in, his army begins the most infamous retreat in history. Retreat. Part one. One second. I want to make sure I'm on the right episode, so I'm not like three episodes ahead. So just, I'm sorry. Okay, Napoleon. Okay, Wellington. Okay, Napoleon's invasion. Okay. I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure I was on the right episode and wasn't. I didn't like jump ahead. So. <laughs> Part one. In 1807. Following his defeat of the Russian army at Friedland, Napoleon had traveled to Tilsit to meet the Russian emperor, Alexander. Don't do this to me. During their celebrated encounter, the two emperors formed a friendship and made an alliance. But it was not to last. Uh -oh. Over the next five years, relations between France and Russia cooled dramatically. The Russians were irritated by Napoleon's creation of a duchy of Warsaw in Poland, which they regarded as meddling in their own front yard. They feared it would lead to the return of a fully-fledged Polish state, a traditional thorn in Russia's side. Then there was Napoleon's offer to marry Alexander's sister, Grand Duchess Anna Pavlovna, to cement their alliance. But the Romanovs hated the idea, and after a year of Russian prevarication, Napoleon married Marie Louise, daughter of the Austrian emperor, instead. Later that year, Napoleon broke a guarantee made at Tilsit and annexed the Duchy of Oldenburg, ruled by Alexander's sister's father-in-law. 
Worst of all was the fallout over the continental system. Napoleon's not very effective economic blockade against Britain, designed to cripple his most steadfast enemy. Alexander had agreed to join the continental system at Tilsit. But it was hugely unpopular in Russia and ruinous to her finances during wow. a period of economic crisis. When Napoleon found out that Russia was flouting the rules of the system and had resumed an illicit trade with Britain, he was furious. With both emperors accusing the other of bad faith, their two countries began preparing for uh, war. Here we go. This video is brought to you by our sponsor, Curiosity Stream, oh, home man. of more than two and a half thousand documentaries exploring science, technology, about humanity's future right now. Would it be TV at sign up to get your first 30 days free? Thanks to Curiosity. Here we go. Your superpowers are pissed. Napoleon knew an invasion of Russia was a massive undertaking, especially as he still had an unfinished war in Spain. Exactly. That was tying down more than 200,000 troops. Nevertheless, in 1811, he began to assemble the largest army Europe had ever seen, around 600,000 men, though what? less than half of them were French. Oh, sorry, let me see if I can finish that. Or well, doesn't matter. Six hundred thousand men. Damn, that's insane, man. Hundred thousand men, though less than half of them were French. Oh my God. The rest came from Allied states across Europe. There was a Polish corps from the Duchy of Warsaw, led by Prince Poniatowski. A corps from each of the German kingdoms of Saxony, Westphalia and Bavaria, from the Kingdom of Italy, as well as Swiss, Dutch, Croat, Spanish and Portuguese units scattered throughout the army. There were even contingents from Prussia and Austria, France's recent enemies, now uneasy allies. Some of these allied troops, such as the Poles and Germans, were as reliable as their French counterparts. Others were very inexperienced, or like the Prussians and Austrians, reluctant to be there at all. Oh, God. This gigantic formation was deployed in three armies. The main force under Napoleon himself, another led by his stepson, Eugène, and a third led by his younger brother, Jérôme, King of Westphalia. Neither of these two were experienced commanders. Though one would distinguish himself on campaign, the other would not. <laughs> on their left flank, Marshal MacDonald led 10th Corps with a large Prussian contingent, while the right flank was guarded by General Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps. Another 100,000 troops were in reserve, including Marshal Victor's 9th Corps. Initially, the Russians only had 220,000 men to face this juggernaut. Organized into Barclay de Tolle's 1st Army, Prince Bagration's 2nd Army, and General Tomasov's Third Army. They would be outnumbered two to one. But in the run-up to war, Russia scored two crucial diplomatic triumphs. Okay. Sweden had been at war with Russia just three years earlier, a conflict which cost her Finland. By a curious turn of events, Sweden was now ruled by Napoleon's ex-marshal Bernadotte. But after Napoleon occupied Swedish Pomerania without warning, a furious Bernadotte promised Russia that Sweden would remain neutral. Meanwhile, a peace treaty with the Ottoman Empire ended Russia's six-year war against its southern rival. These two agreements secured Russia. Oh. I don't know why I paused because he's probably going to say exactly what I'm what I'm thinking. Okay, you know he Russia doesn't have to worry about these you know basically these side wars or side conflicts now with Sweden and the Ottoman Empire. But yet France still has to worry about Spain and getting troops being held down there. But Russia can just gather all her troops for this one battle and just concentrate on that, which <laughs> I'm sure he's just about to say. <laughs> Southern rival. These two agreements secured Russia's flanks from any strategic threat. 
True. and freed up troops to face Napoleon's invasion. Exactly. On the 24th of June, 1812, French troops began crossing the Nyman River into Russian territory. The army was so large, the crossing took five days. <laughs> Napoleon's plan was to attack north of the impassable Pripet marshes and defeat Barclay's army, while Jerome pinned Bagration in place. French forces would then swing south to trap Bagration. Napoleon expected the campaign to be over in five weeks. But the sheer size of the French army convinced the cautious Barclay that retreat was his only option. Prince Bagration, a much more aggressive commander by instinct, and often Barclay's fierce critic, was forced to agree. Uh -oh. As they withdrew, they burned villages and crops, part of a scorched earth strategy to deny supplies to the enemy. In four days, Napoleon had reached Vilnius, but Barclay was gone. To the south, Jerome failed to pin down Bagration. So when Davout's first corps swung southeast to trap him, he'd already withdrawn to safety. Napoleon's younger brother was out of his depth, stung by the emperor's criticism, humiliated when his troops were put under Marshal Davout's command, he resigned his post and returned to Westphalia. The campaign was already beginning to expose serious flaws in Napoleon's plan. Yeah. Knowing his troops would struggle to live off the land in this impoverished region, he'd organized huge supply depots and transport units to feed the army. But wagons rolled slowly along Russia's bad roads, which were turned to rivers of mud by summer thunderstorms. The army had to make frequent stops mm. to allow its supplies to catch up. Bad news for Napoleon's plan to catch the Russians, but a much needed relief for the many thousands of young conscripts in his army, not used to hard marches day after day. Many were soon yeah. dropping out with exhaustion. Others deserted. Yeah. There were also huge problems of command and control over a vast multinational army that was three times bigger than any Napoleon had commanded before. Yeah, just think about it. I just, man, all that, what it takes to control that many people, like different languages, like different leaders from different countries. I mean, that's just a little, that's just a nightmare, I guess, for any commander. And then, I don't know, just, just trying to feed everybody. I mean, like, you have to have everything go perfect. The roads are a mess. And, and this is the summertime. Just wait till like you know if, if they're still fighting till winter time. I mean, forget it. They're just gonna freeze to death. They'll have to like retreat or something. Uh, but yeah, man, not starting off good with Napoleon. You think, you know, if Russia, you know, they're used to this kind of weather. I mean, they're used to the roads. And they know the terrain, so they know what they're doing. Uh, I mean, they they might just take advantage of the situation and decide let's get them while you know let's get them while they're down while they're struggling, or they just might wait until they're struggling even harder. I don't know. Wait them out. Multinational army that was three times bigger than any Napoleon had commanded before. La Grande Armée, once famed for its speed of maneuver, had become a lumbering beast. After a pause to rest and regroup at Vilnius, Napoleon resumed his advance. Barclay continued his retreat to Vitebsk, where he hoped Bagration's second army would be able to join him. But Davu blocked Bagration's path at Sultanovka, forcing him to make for Smolensk instead. At Vitebsk, Napoleon clashed with Barclay's rearguard, but once more the Russians escaped after setting fire to all the stores they couldn't take with them. Napoleon's getting deeper into Meanwhile, Russian territory. Meanwhile, 300 miles away, on Napoleon's southern flank, Russian 3rd Army attacked and defeated the Saxon 7th Corps, forcing Napoleon to divert Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps to their aid. By the end of July, 
Napoleon had advanced 250 miles into Russia, much further than he'd planned. Yeah. And the long marches in extreme summer heat continued to take a heavy toll on his men. Without fighting a major battle, the army had already suffered 20% casualties from exhaustion wow. and illness, particularly typhus and dysentery. The army had entered Russia with a quarter of a million horses, but they were now dying at a rate of a thousand every day. See, this Russia is just so big. Like, Russia, they, they, they basically just have to wait them out like that. Their armies just, like, get yourself in a city border up and just, just have time tick by. Just trying to avoid battles and just maybe jump from city to city and just wait them out. I mean, it just seems like, you know, what their plan is or, you know, what's going to happen, maybe. But they were now dying at a rate of a thousand every day from exhaustion and lack of fodder. Yeah. It wasn't just cavalry horses that were dying, but the very horses that were supposed to haul the army's transport wagons. Right. Making a bad situation worse. I'm going to starve too. This crisis in horsepower came just as the French light cavalry, Napoleon's eyes and ears, met their match in Russia's Cossacks. What are Cossacks? Cossacks. Self-reliant, proud, ruthless, and superb horsemen didn't play by the same rules as other European cavalry. Hmm. Every day they shadowed Napoleon's army swooping in whenever they saw an easy target, but melting away into the forests if they were attacked by a stronger force. Smart, the guerrilla warfare, kinda. Cossacks, as well as Russian partisans, made hit and run attacks on French supply lines and depots, forcing Napoleon to divert thousands of troops to their defense. Alongside Russian regular light cavalry, they also prevented French patrols from carrying out reconnaissance, which meant that Napoleon often lacked good information about roads or the enemy's whereabouts. True. Napoleon stayed 16 days at Vitebsk, resting his troops and considering his options. Among his many mounting concerns was the security of his long, exposed flanks. But at Vitebsk, he received news that Schwarzenberg had defeated the Russians at Gorodezhna. A week later at Polatsk, a French Bavarian force fought Wittgenstein's Russian First Corps to a standstill. Napoleon's flanks were secure for now. Now. Although his main force had been reduced to less than half its original strength, Napoleon decided to push on to Smolensk try to force the Russians into a decisive battle for the city. Barclay was indeed under pressure to give battle from fellow commander Prince Bagration and Emperor Alexander in St. Petersburg. The army's morale and Russia's honor required it, they told him. Here we go. With the first and second Russian armies finally linking up near Smolensk, Barclay decided to attack Napoleon's army, which he believed was concentrated around Rudnya. The offensive was led by General Platov's Cossacks, who surprised a French cavalry division at Inkova. But alarmed by false reports that Eugène's IV Corps was outflanking him to the north, Barclay called off the attack. Oh, wow. Napoleon, reassured that Barclay's offensive posed no real threat, began a grand outflanking move to the south to take Smolensk and cut off the Russian retreat. The so-called Smolensk maneuver was Napoleon at his best, using Murat's cavalry to screen his movements and keep Barclay in the dark. The emperor okay. reached the Dnipro on the evening of the 13th of August. His engineers quickly threw up four pontoon bridges, and by dawn the next day, his army was across. Marshal Davout led a second column across the river at Orsha. But a single Russian division, the 27th, 
fought a heroic fighting retreat from Krasny, delaying the French advance and buying time for Bagration to reinforce oh, the Smolensk did garrison. Make it? No. The chance for a surprise assault on the city was lost. Uh. And as the Russian army began to pull back, Napoleon displayed an uncharacteristic lack of urgency, even halting the army for a parade to mark his 43rd birthday. What? When the main attack on Smolensk began two days later, Napoleon opted for a front. You had a parade go on, basically in the middle of a war. Come on, Napoleon, man. Great commander and all, but uh, make the big head of yourself there, man. I don't know about that move. Back on Smolensk began two days later. Napoleon opted for a frontal assault. 150 French guns battered the city as three French corps attacked its medieval fortifications. The Russians resisted bravely, but Barclay, fearing encirclement, ordered another retreat. With Smolensk in flames, the Russians began to pull out. Just as the French fought their way into the city, to scenes of utter devastation. Damn. Bagration's second army withdrew first. As Barclay's army followed, its rear guard was caught by Ney's third corps uh. at Valutino. General Junot, commanding the Westphalian eighth corps, had orders to cut off Barclay's retreat. But having crossed the river, he did nothing, and the opportunity was lost. A furious wow. Napoleon swore that Junot would never now win his marshal's battle. The Battle of Smolensk cost both sides around 10,000 casualties and destroyed one of Russia's most historic and holy cities, but settled nothing. Eastern. Well, it's like now Russia's going to be farther in, I mean, yeah, into their own territory. And that's just, the farther they go in, just the, the worse it gets for Napoleon. Because then there's just more supply lines, the farther, uh, come on, Napoleon, get the, get your army together. After the missed chance to defeat the Russians at Smolensk, Napoleon paused once more to consider his options. His men were weary and far from home, and it was already late in the campaigning season. He considered sitting out the Russian winter at Smolensk and resuming the campaign in 1813. But now he was just 230 miles from Moscow. A century earlier, Peter the Great had moved Russia's capital to St. Petersburg, but Moscow remained its historic and spiritual heart, a prize for which the Russians had to fight. Yeah. Napoleon, always a gambler, decided to push on. Oh. The Russians faced their own dilemma. Emperor Alexander had experienced a kind of religious epiphany that summer and rallied the Russian people to the country's defense, describing the war with Napoleon as a war to save Holy Mother Russia from the Antichrist. For months, the emperor had received conflicting advice to stand and fight or retreat. Now he decided change was needed. The cautious General Barclay kept his job, but the emperor summoned General Mikhail Kutuzov to take overall command of Russia's armies. Okay. Kutuzov had been beaten by Napoleon at Austerlitz seven years before. But he'd since won several victories against the Ottoman Empire and was a true Russian, loved by the troops. Although yeah. Kutuzov agreed with Barclay's strategy of delay, he saw that constant retreats were destroying the soldiers' and the nation's morale. If Moscow was given up without a battle, the fallout could be disastrous. That's true. And so, 70 miles west of the city, near the village of Borodino, the Russian army prepared to make a stand. Damn. Europe was about to witness the bloodiest day's fighting 
of the Napoleonic Wars. Oh! Are we in for a good one? Are we in for it? Oh, yeah, Thank course. you to all I our Patreon that. supporters for making this series possible. I knew it was coming to the end of the video. Like, there's no way they're going to put this, like, giant battle. You're going to fit this giant battle in. Ah, uh, they wait till next episode. <laughs> it's just like one of those, like, I don't know, it's one of those shows. It's like, you can wait till next week. But at least I ain't got to wait till next week. I just wait till tomorrow. But, uh, like I said, Napoleon, I mean, he's pushing him back. I mean, is he winning the war? Is he not? I mean, he, he was lost like half his troops just by not even in the war, just by starving and stuff. And I don't know. Uh, but this is the battle, you know. Uh, can he take it? I mean, they're not in Moscow yet. I can see something similar happening, maybe a giant battle where it's a kind of a stalemate and then the Russians fall back maybe to Moscow. And then Napoleon's kind of left with another decision. Do I continue to chase? Or it's like, winter's coming, I have to retreat and it's start all over the following year. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. But I, it's going to be a lot of death, though. The biggest, you know, biggest battle with the most people. After Napoleon ever. So, we'll find out, though. We'll find out. It's being exciting. It's like, this episode's just like the build-up to, like, the big battle. Just a big build-up episode, just a little tease for us. But anyways, anyways, please hit that like and subscribe button if you haven't, and we'll definitely catch you guys tomorrow and see the uh, the outcome. So only come on top. I know most of you already know, and I'm like left in the dark here, but we'll find out, guys. We'll find out. Uh, thank you for watching. It's been a lot of fun, and I'll definitely catch you guys tomorrow. Which I'm expecting an epic fight go down. So that's going to be really cool. And yeah. I'll catch you guys in future videos. Thank you.